Welcome back to Fix It Wise in our Rock Garden series. This is where you get to fix, build, and cook amazing things. In this episode, this is the third episode in our five-episode Rock Garden series, we're going to be talking about the welding and the forming of the metal. It's involved. However, I'm going to give you an alternative. If you don't want to go to all the trouble, we're going to show you with the welding and you don't want to buy all the equipment. This is some great flexible border that will allow you to bend tight radiuses to form the shapes that you want in your garden. It's not quite as tall as our border. It's an inch and a quarter, but it will hold rocks of various sizes. So this is a great alternative if you don't want to invest in the equipment or the time to learn to weld. But we're going to show you how we did it and give you some tips on welding and forming the metal. If you're like us, we first considered the standard metal edging that you can buy just about anywhere. It's about four inches tall and, and it comes in 10 foot sections, shorter sections, and it comes even in round sections. This really didn't work for us. We've used this. It's a great product elsewhere, but it really didn't work for us for our rock garden because we needed some really tight radiuses to form the spiral that Kathy had designed. And you can't bend this. I mean, you could if you spent thousands of dollars on a machine to bend four inch wide metal, but you can't practically bend this. So we're going to show you a better alternative. We ended up using this two inch strapping. This is one eighth inch thick strapping, two inches wide. And you can form that and bend that in one of these inexpensive metal benders. And that's what what we used. And it's it was a bit of a learning curve to learn how to use this, but it was actually quite a bit of fun. And I can see this in the future, many projects. It'll bend round bar and it'll bend up to two inch wide strapping, uh, up, up to five sixteenths inch thick. I wouldn't really try that, but, but this is eighth inch and it, it bent pretty easily by hand with this. But this has all kind of different dies for different projects, and I can see a lot of fun in our future for this. So this is how we formed the metal strapping. And then the other component was just 3 8 inch rebar. This is also called number three rebar. You can get it anywhere. I cut it into 12 inch spikes, and I drove those down on the ground and then welded those to the metal strapping after I had formed it in the metal former. There are three basic steps to install the metal border. Number one, lay out strings and draw a template on some heavy duty landscapers weed barrier. Number two, bend the metal to conform to your template. And number three, weld the bent metal to 12 inch rebar stakes driven at precise locations along your template. Here's a tip. In addition to keeping the work area cleaner, Heavy Duty Landscaper's Weed Barrier makes an excellent canvas to draw your template for the metal border to follow. We use colored strings to help identify which rocks the border would contain. Laying out the template is not a super precise thing, just kind of measure it out and think about spacing and proportions, eyeing things from your hand sketch as you go along. The best part about the strings is that it allows you to adjust things, moving them around until you get it just right and before you make it permanent with the magic marker. Speaking of adjustments, after we laid out the strings and drew Kathy's design on the weed barrier, we realized that our original idea of a three foot by three foot disappearing fountain basin would not fit at the spiral end. Here you can see where we overlaid the outline of the fountain basin with blue tape over the spiral area of the template. Luckily, we had not purchased the basin yet, but we had purchased these tall, flat, oval-shaped fountain planters. We simply use them as regular planters because we like them so much. This was a great example of staying flexible and adjusting as you go. Next, having one of these floor-mounted metal benders on site and near your space is vital. This enabled us to bend a little, lay it on the ground near the template, bend a little more, lay it on the ground, repeat, repeat, repeat. This process worked great and I was able to follow Kathy's lines perfectly. 
I can't imagine trying to order something pre-bent like this from your local fabrication shop. Sure, they could bend it, but drawing it for them with proper dimensions and notations would take quite a bit of CAD design skills. Plus, how would you adjust it on location? And you always have to adjust on location, no matter how good the drawings are. The good news is that it doesn't have to be bent perfectly on the metal bender in order for it to fit the final shape on the ground. The great thing about using the 8th inch by 2 inch strapping is that it adjusts by hand somewhat easily on the ground after bending it on the metal bender, especially for the longer radiuses and arcs. As long as you get it in the ballpark on the metal bender, you can tweak it a little using weights and pulling it to the rebar stakes by hand. In fact, only the really tight arcs need to be bent more precisely with the metal bender, and even those I was able to tweak a little bit on the ground. The really long arcs simply conform to however you lay them and weight them down. Here's a tip that I use all of the time. Use 25 pound dumbbells as weights to temporarily secure the border. These come in handy on many projects. They easily slid around to various positions needed to hold down the metal strapping. The best part about the dumbbells is that they are a great way to find out exactly where to locate the rebar stakes. It's important to note that this 2 inch strapping material usually comes in standardized 20 foot or 24 foot links at your local supply house. For our longer design footprint, it was important to buy them as long as possible. Just be sure to buy enough to be able to use as many whole pieces as you can. Do not try to piece any leftover scraps together to save money. Here's the reason. The less joints you have in the metal strapping, the better. Any welded seams that you have to make in these straps will make it harder to bend the material in the metal bender. This is because welding changes the hardness of the steel in the immediate area of the weld. This makes it behave differently than the steel on either side of the weld when you try to bend it. The bottom line is that it's harder to get a smooth, even radius when there is a weld joint in the middle of the material. Okay, we brought the metal bender inside the studio. Excuse the green screen back here. But we thought it'd be a great example to show you how you actually bend the metal up close. Normally, we'd be bending this metal, but we're going to use our belt to show you how it bends. But that's a great example. But normally we would be doing multiple taps along these lines in our two inch by eighth inch strapping. But let me show you how it works when we set it up with the belt. And you basically feed the material in through the stop block side and then around through the other side. And we've got this three inch roller and then we've got an inch and a half roller on the handle die holder. And what, what happens is you pretend your metal is straight and then you just move this handle around and you can see how it just bends that metal around that larger three inch die. And the fact that these rotate, both of them, allows it a smooth operation. Now, normally we wouldn't make a continuous bend like that, especially on thicker material. You can get away with that on thinner material, but normally what we do is follow those lines and do a series of taps. Feed the material, tap. Feed the material, tap. And just feed it in a little bit at a time, and those multiple taps will end up with a nice smooth radius. Let's take this thing apart and, sh and show you how we assemble it and where the dies go. Two dies here and then our stop block in the back. These floor mounted metal benders come with an array of pins, hole locations, and dies. There are several combinations that will yield similar results. After some trial and error, here's what I found to work best for our setup. By the way, here's a tip. I represent several fabrication shops in my business. Metal bending is always more art than science. Even the professional fabrication shops using CNC controlled press brakes use a bit of trial and error until they get it dialed in. What ended up working best for me here was to use the largest three inch die in the center pin. The center pin attaches the handle die receiver to the U-shaped area of the ring assembly. The center pin holding the 3 inch die goes in the end holes where the handle die receiver attaches to the end holes in the U-shaped area of the ring assembly. 
allowing the handle to pivot from the very end hole. Use a second inch and a half die in the upper holes in the handle die receiver. I mainly used hole number three and number four for this inch and a half die, depending on the radius of the arc I needed. You move the inch and a half die back and forth in the handle die receiver to bend longer or tighter arcs as needed. Next, set up the square stop block in the third hole in the upper U-shaped area of the ring assembly, while placing the support pin under it. This stop block area is where you feed the material in and the stop block serves to clamp the steel material and holds it in place while you bend it on the other side. You can also use a pair of vice grips to clamp the steel here, but the value of the stop block is that it releases quickly and easily so you continue to feed the steel as you make multiple taps hitting the material at the die. Here's a pro tip. Use multiple taps with the handle die into the material in succession and close to each other to form arcs. This is actually how professional fabrication shops use CNC controlled press brakes and make radius and flat sheets of metal. If the multiple taps of the die are close enough, you can barely see that they are actually multiple straight line bends which form the arcs. Here are a couple of bending tips that I found useful along the way. Use your hip and your body weight as leverage to push the handle. This frees up your hands to move the material in and out. And finally, bolt the metal bender to a three quarter inch piece of plywood and weight it down or clamp it to the ground somehow. We were able to clamp ours to the driveway grate using extra large 3 8 toggle bolts. This prevented us from having to drill holes in the driveway. Now all that's left to do is weld the bent metal straps to the 12 inch rebar stakes as you drive them in along your template. The good news is that all of your welds are pretty much hidden. The only welds that really show are any butt welds if you must seam together any longer border straps. You can see some examples of butt weld clips on our website that will help you make those butt welds beautiful. Ugly welds don't matter that much for this project, and believe me, it takes many years of practice to make a pretty weld. I still haven't mastered that. A structurally sound weld that's good enough to hold landscape border together does not necessarily have to be pretty. After all, we're not supporting life or limb here. The best news is that all it takes is a strong tack weld to each side of the rebar stake and one to the top where it meets the side wall of the two inch metal border. In fact, tack welds are preferred because if you lay down a long weld bead, the extra heat will soften the steel strapping and your beautifully formed arcs will distort from their original shape. Now that's a bad day. These tack welds are below the rock surface, so they will not even be seen. Simply drive your rebar stakes down far enough to get them down to the midpoint of the strapping. They should end up being about one inch below the top of the metal strapping. You got to use a welding blanket and some scraps of steel to protect the landscaper's weed barrier from burning holes and catching on fire. Shown here is my old white fiberglass weld blanket, which I don't recommend anymore. I've upgraded to a better one that doesn't shed fine glass particles. No more itchy skin. You can get my newly recommended weld blanket on our website. A 120 volt wire feed welder is very helpful on a project like this. 220 volt welders are super cool, but problematic for mobility issues and finding a 220 volt power source located outside. The good news is that you do not need a 220 volt powered machine to weld 1 8 cent thick steel to number three rebar. However, I do recommend that you get the most powerful 120 volt welder that you can. These 120 volt wire feed welders max out in the 140 amp output range. My 140 amp Lincoln is a combo MIG flux core wire feed machine and can handle up to 3 16 thick steel with one weld pass and up to 5 16 with multiple passes. Luckily, 99% of my welding is 3 16 and below. On those few occasions that I do weld any thicker material, it does struggle a little. One day I'll up my game and get a second 220 volt wire feed welder. But for the most part, this high amp 120 volt model has been great. And I'll always keep it around for outdoor mobile projects like this. I've owned this Lincoln 140 amp MIG flux core wire welder for over 15 years and she's never let me down. We're back in the studio with a couple of pro tips, mainly to help my ugly welds. 
My welds are structurally sound, but nah, not so pretty. Something I've discovered recently is something called nozzle gel. This is made by Hobart, and all you do is every once in a while, dip the tip of your welding gun in this nozzle gel, and it helps prevent weld splatter from forming on the tip of your gun, which really interferes with the wire coming out and, and pretty weld. So that was a recent discovery I had. But speaking of welding wire, that's my second tip for you. On this project, since it was outside, we had to use what's called flux core welding wire. Now, this machine will do both MIG and flux core wire. MIG actually pumps a shielding gas through the welding gun and shields that weld with the gas. In the case of flux core wire, your middle of the wire is, is flux, so that creates a gas that protects the weld. Basically, what both of these do are to prevent oxygen from oxidizing that weld pool and, and basically ruining it. The problem when you use MIG is that outside is that it blows away in the wind. So it works great inside, actually makes a prettier weld, but it can only be used in total lack of wind conditions. So outside pretty much negates that. So this flux core, but here's a tip. Lincoln recommends a 0.035 flux core for this machine. I've recently discovered that a 0.030, a little bit smaller diameter, is actually more forgiving. It doesn't require as much amperage, so therefore it doesn't blow through the material, which is very common. It'll just blow a hole right through your material. I mean, the idea is you want to penetrate the metal with the weld, but you don't want to blow a hole through it. Now, if it's thicker metal, of course, I use the recommended 0.035, but most of my stuff is thinner, eight, eighth inch thick and lower gauge metal. So this 0.030, I'm really finding makes a prettier weld for me, and it's, it's a fairly new discovery. I wanted to share that with you. It's hard to find because it's a smaller diameter with the flux in it. So I've sourced it, and I've got a link on the website to show you that.